Hello everybody and welcome back. Um, we are moving on. The Civil War ended last week, hopefully you noticed, um, and the Civil War ended with, hopefully as you know, a Union victory. And with the victory of the Union forces, that brings two dramatic changes to the nation, the United States. Uh, one is that, of course, those seceded southern states are now being forced back into the Union. Uh, you know, their secession is what prompted the Civil War in the first place. The North wins, suddenly the South has to come back into the Union. And the South is going to have to come back into the Union free of slavery. Uh, and that's going to be dramatic. That's going to be a huge change for those southern states. And so the reunification of North and South in the, after the end of the Civil War is going to spark a long and fierce debate among Americans over what is this country going to look like now that the war is over. Civil War lasted for four years. 600 and some odd thousand dead soldiers, plus untold suffering among civilians. Uh, you've read about Sherman's March and all of that. Uh, there's going to be, you know, landscape in ruins throughout the South. There's going to be loss of agriculture, a uh, hugely destructive conflict, all in a four-year period. What comes after that four-year period, though, in some ways is even more important than the four years of the Civil War. And that period that comes after the Civil War is the period known as Reconstruction. How are we going to put this country back together again now that the war is over? And Reconstruction is going to be a 12-year argument between Northerners, Southerners, Whites, Blacks. Um, it's going to be this big debate over what is the country going to look like. And so Reconstruction, which lasts roughly from the end of the Civil War in 1865 through 1877, and there is a definite date for the end of Reconstruction, which we'll talk about as we get to the end of this little talk here. But in this 12-year period, Americans are going to debate what is the country going to look like now that we're entering this new post-Civil War era. This new era of modernity that, that, that we've seen how industrialized warfare, we've seen it, the rise of industrialization. The world is entering something new. There's a new era dawning in the mid-19th century. And the, it's, that new era is dawning in the United States in the wake of the Civil War. Because everybody knows at the end of the Civil War, nothing's going to look the way it did before the Civil War. Before the Civil War, I mean, you had a very small government, you had you know, far-flung, um, um, not colonies, but, you know, states and, and, and settlements and all of that. During the Civil War, you had a massive expansion of railroads, which are going to bring all those far-flung territories into a new national ter transportation network. Um, there's going to be, of course, no more slavery after the Civil War. Uh, and so we're entering this new era, and the debate is going to be, what is this new era going to look like? And there's going to be a lot of bickering and arguing over what is the new, what is the country going to look like in the wake of the Civil War. And so that's what I'm going to be talking about here, um, right now. So first off, I'm going to start off by talking about just basically what does the country look like at the end of the Civil War? Um, you know, foreshadowing, it doesn't look good. And then we're going to talk about, okay, the, what is, what does the end of slavery mean, uh, from a legal and a social perspective and all of that? And then we're going to talk a bit about the kind of the political back and forth, the social back and forth, the legal back and forth, the racial back and forth that's going to be happening among Americans, um, uh, North, South, Black, White. Uh, it, there's going to be arguments all over the place about what does Reconstruction mean and who's in charge of Reconstruction and what does that mean for the people who aren't in charge. Um, this is going to be a very long debate. And then we'll wrap up by talking about kind of some of the long consequences of Reconstruction, uh, the legacies of Reconstruction. So to start with, this the, the, the United States, I want to just back up a little bit and talk about a thing that I've mentioned a few times um, in these in these discussions here. One is, uh, to start with, I want to remind you that the United States had gone through a number of important racial compromises regarding slavery before the Civil War. We had the Constitutional Convention, the Missouri Compromise, Compromise of 1850, and the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854. 
I'm not going to go back into details of all those. I've talked about that before. You're welcome to go look it up. But I just want to remind you that there were these four major compromises that had happened up to the Civil War, and none of them prevented the Civil War from happening. But I want you to, re to remember, those four compromises were all, over the were all over the issue of slavery. And now, in the wake of the Civil War, slavery is no longer in effect. And so that, that solves an important issue involved in this, ra this kind of long-running racial debate in the United States. But as we're going to see, it's not going to quite solve the racial issue. And of course, in the wake of the Civil War, the South is completely demolished. I mean, this is uh, Richmond at the end of the Civil War, Richmond, Virginia at the end of the war. Um, here we've got Charleston, South Carolina, which, it, you know, bombed to shreds. Columbia, South Carolina in ruins. Atlanta, Georgia in ruins. Um, this is Richmond again in ruins. The all of them, almost all of the major cities of the South were in ruins at the end of the Civil War. Um, vast acreages of farmlands were ruined at the end of the Civil War. And the political system that had existed in the South before and during the war was destroyed by the end of the war. So there was an entire political class or, you know, an entire generation of political leadership in those southern states that were either dead or in exile, not literally in exile, but kicked out of government because, of course, when the Union conquers a new territory, all those political leaders are going to get booted out of office and either replaced by Union military officers or replaced by locals who are sympathetic to the Union. So the old political class is gone at the end of the Civil War. So there goes all that leadership. Now, we, you know, Northerners rejoiced about that. But from a practical perspective, that means that all of the people in the South who knew how to get things done and how to make the, you know, how to make the trains run on time and all of that, those folks are all gone. And so now there's a, there's a new pressing, a problem pressing in the South is how do we build a new class of political leadership in these Southern states? Where do we find these people? How do we find people that are going to be reflecting Southern values, quote unquote? Uh, so what now? How do we how do we create how do we replace that that gone that lost political system? And then the other big question for Southerners facing is how are they going to recover financially from the war? Before the war, there had of course been you know three sources of wealth in the South. Um, one was uh, cash uh, issued issued by Southern banks. You know there wasn't a unified national currency in those days. Each bank would issue its own currency. So there was cash. Um, there was land, the value of land. And there was slaves, the value of slaves. There's a bit of a debate among economists over what was the value of slaves in those, in those days. I mean, there were roughly 4 million slaves in the South. And there was, there's been some economists who have tried to kind of map it out and say, and there's, and have made an argument that slaves put into modern terms were worth somewhere on the order of $10 trillion. It's an amazing amount of money that was invested in the institution of slavery. Because, I mean, you think about there's the purchase price of slaves. You're invest, so you're, if you're a slave owner, you're investing money in the purchase of slaves. You got to keep them alive. You got to keep them fed. You got to keep them housed. And again, that may be substandard, but there are costs that Southern slave owners are putting into this institution of slavery. At the end of the war, all the cash is gone. That stuff's been all wiped out. I mean, this, the Confederate government's taxed everybody to pay for the Confederate war effort. And then when that war ended, none of those people got their money back. So cash, there's very little cash flowing in the South. Um, all that value of slaves is gone. Uh, there's going to be no compensation for slave owners, which, again, from a northern perspective, from a modern perspective, that's a good thing. But from the southern Confederate perspective, that is Again, somewhere on the order of 10 trillion. Now that number may be inflated, but whatever. Pick some, um, you know, huge ungodly number. And that amount of money is now just poof gone. And you're never going to see it again. So Southerners are in a very difficult situation. All they have left is land. And that land isn't going to generate money the way it used to because you don't have workers anymore like you used to.
And so a problem for Southern whites is that there's nobody to do the work on these mega plantations. They want to rebuild the plantations and re, you know, reestablish Confederate or not Confederate, but Southern agriculture. They want to rebuild all of that. They don't have slaves anymore to do that. And so the big question has become, oh, how are we going to do that? There's no cash floating around. We don't have a workforce anymore, at least not a slaved workforce. So what are we going to do uh, to create, um, to recreate the South? And uh, we'll talk a little bit about some of this stuff as we go forward here. But the one thing that I want to talk about, how do we rebuild the South? The one thing I want you to think about, of, of course, is the concept of sharecropping. Uh, where there's a whole lot of, turns out anyway, there's a whole lot of unemployed people in the South, ma mainly former slaves. And so Southern landowners are going to enter into agreements with former slaves where they, but this system they call sharecropping. Uh, and so I'd like, I want you to read up on the concept of sharecropping and think about when you're, when you've got a sharecropping system, who wins and who loses. I'll give you a hint. Nobody wins in sharecropping. Uh, you might think the white landowner wins. Nope. Uh, the former, you know, the former slaves, they might win. Nope. Nobody wins in sharecropping. But anyway, that's something for you to take a look at. So moving on. Um, again, there's been this abolition of slavery, the emancipation. The 13th Amendment passed in 1865, uh, back when the Confederates weren't <laughs> were at worst had seceded they uh southern representatives in congress weren't back in congress yet and so uh, uh the um northerners left behind in congress were able to put through this amendment outlawing slavery pretty easily uh which says neither slavery nor involuntary servitude except as a punishment for a crime that part's going to be important except as a punishment for a crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted uh, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. So slavery is outlawed, involuntary servitude is outlawed, except as punishment for a crime. We'll come back to that in a sec. But this opens up a huge ball of ball of problems. That's not right. Anyway, uh, it opens up a whole bunch of problems for Southerners because you can't enslave black people anymore. So the old system that they've been depending on for generations is gone. And I talked last time, maybe it was the time before, about the justifications for slavery that Southerners had created for themselves. So they had been indoctrinating themselves for generation after generation into this idea that slavery was a good thing for white people and for black people. And sudden, and, and had been convincing themselves their, their entire civilization was built on slavery. Suddenly slavery is not there anymore. And that's going to cause a huge problem for Southerners psychologically. How do they react to a world in which slavery is no longer in existence? Slavery was the thing that they have always been told is the source of their greatness, the source of their success. And now it is gone. That's a huge problem uh, for um, Southern whites, especially. Okay. Now, what does it mean to be free? This, I mean... Look, you know, we might look at it and say, well, you know, you're not a slave. Okay, so you're free. The problem is, what does that mean that you are free? Are you now a full American citizen entitled to all rights of citizenship? Uh, you may, this may be a good time to think back to when I was talking about abolitionism a couple weeks ago, uh, when one of the big stumbling blocks that they encountered was that most Americans, North and South, white Americans anyway, never actually believed that black people were equal to white people. Uh, they, they were never, there was never a, 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 a widespread fight for racial equality. The thing that a lot of white people didn't like was slavery. But that, does, but being anti-slavery is not the same as being pro-equality, and so, hopefully, unsurprisingly, anyway, there's going to be a pretty big fight over between blacks and whites and north and south over what is actually what does freedom actually mean, because to black people, freedom from slavery means the world. It means that now. Former slaves are now going to become American citizens with all of the various rights and responsibilities of being an American citizen. And so this this um, poster here is showing that black people now are expecting that they're going to get to take part in politics. They're going to get, you know, 
enjoy legal marriage, so to speak. They're going to get to be legislators. They're going to get to be doctors. They're going to get to be preachers. Uh, they, they can be farmers if they want, but it's going to be by choice. Uh, they're going to become educated. This one down here at the bottom left corner. Uh, they're going to engage in political debates of the time. There's this kind of joyous sense among freed slaves that freedom means everything. We are now, we free slaves, excuse me, are now going to become fully productive members of the American body politic. And they fully expect that to happen right away. I mean, that's what the Emancipation Proclamation and then the 13th Amendment is supposed to bring absolute freedom to the slaves. And that's what black uh, freed slaves expect. Now, of course, you can probably imagine that others didn't quite feel the same way. Southern whites, ne who never believed in any kind of racial equality or anything like that, they may have accepted the idea that slavery is gone, begrudgingly, not happy about it, but they may have accepted that slavery is gone, but they're going to do everything they can to create a, a racial hierarchy and a racial control system in southern states that will be as close to slavery as they can get without crossing the line of the 13th Amendment. And so what they did is they start to, they, they grabbed onto that phrase that I mentioned in the 13th Amendment about accept as punishment for a crime. And they're going to use that clause to try to recreate a slave-like system that's going to be a slightly different from slavery, but it's going to be as close as they can get. And uh, Mississippi took the lead on this in 1866 when they started passing a bunch of new laws that collectively became known as the Black Code and the uh, Vagrancy Law, where Mississippi started making it a law where um, white people can stop a black person on the street and demand that black person sh explain or provide proof that that black person has a job and has a place to live. Now the problem that hopefully you can see right away is that most former slaves of course do not have regular jobs and a lot of them do not have places to live. And if you cannot prove that you are gainfully employed and that you have legal residence somewhere, that's a jailable offense. So black people start going to jail uh, because they cannot provide proof of where they live and where they work. When you go to jail, you incur a fine. Black people cannot pay that fine. And so there's a provision in the code here. This is this uh, section five here, which says that if the prisoner cannot who was convicted of the misdemeanor under these vagrancy laws and black codes, if they can't pay the fine, somebody else can. The sheriff can hire that um, black person out to somebody else to work off the fine. And so you can probably imagine who's going to pay the fine. Well, there's some plantation owners down the way, possibly even the former slave's former master, who will then pay the, the fine, put that person to work, that person has to work on the plantation for X number of time until they work off the debt. Then, after a while, they work off the debt. They're not getting paid. They're working off a debt because this is, this is in punishment of a crime. And so they, when they've paid off the debt, they leave. They go down the street. Guess what happens? They get stopped by a white person again who demands to see where are you gainfully employed? Where's your legal residence? They still don't have it. They go back to jail. The cycle happens all over again. And so Southerners figure out a way, they start gaming the system to create a system that is as close to slavery as they can get without crossing that 13th Amendment line. And so they create a generation of, of blacks who are criminals. And when they're criminals, the 13th Amendment is a little bit looser. So, so, so Southerners are going to create this system where black people are almost by default criminals. And as soon as they are, they are no longer fully protected by the 13th Amendment anymore. So Southern whites are going to embrace this type of gamesmanship to try to reinforce the old racial hierarchy, skirt slavery as much as they can. Now, Northerners are kind of split. Northern whites I'm talking about here, and some, some Northern blacks too. But Northerners are, are not, so, so you've got the black interpretation of freedom is, you know, full citizenship. White Interpretation of freedom means you're, okay, fine, you're free from slavery, but you are not 
equal to, to me as a southern white man. Uh, Northerners are a bit more split. Um, Lincoln had been a huge fan of reconciliation without punishing Southerners. You may remember in his second inaugural address, he had talked about with malice toward none, with charity toward all, let's bind up our wounds and move on to a glorious future. Paraphrasing the end there. But Lincoln's take on it is that Southerners are our brothers. We need to welcome them back to the table with a minimum of, minimum of fuss. Bring them back in. Yeah, they're going to have to accept the emancipation of slaves, but... Beyond that, let's move on with our lives. Lincoln wants reconciliation instead of punishment. Um, Lincoln's political opponents, the Democratic Party, they wanted reconciliation, but with a minimum of social disruption. It, they were, they, okay, emancipation is a given, but Democrats were fully in support of laws like, like the Mississippi Black Codes and the Vagrancy Law and all of that. Democrats were totally comfortable with the idea that we need to have a minimum of social disruption. We need to have a minimum disruption to the racial hierarchy. We need to maintain social order as much as we can. And so from the Democratic perspective, yeah, let's bring them back, but let's not impose anything beyond emancipation of slaves on uh, those southern southerners let's bring them back as peacefully as we can with a minimum of punishment in a way they were they agreed with lincoln uh surprisingly you would think that's kind of odd but again lincoln's asking for reconciliation not punishment but lincoln's political allies the republicans though aren't feeling as generous as lincoln at the end of the war the radical Republicans, as they're going to be called, were looking for punishment. It's the Confederates started this war by illegally seceding from the Union, by firing at Fort Sumter, and then by firing and killing 360-odd thousand Union soldiers. Yeah, the, the Confederates lost 260,000 also, but this was the Southerners' fault. And the Republicans in the North want to punish those Southerners for the, for the crimes of the Civil War. And so Lincoln wanted reconciliation. The Democrats want reconciliation. The Republicans don't. Guess what happens in 1865? Lincoln dies. And so suddenly Lincoln was, in some ways, ironically, the Democrats' best friend. And he's dead. When he dies, we've got a whole new question of what's going to happen to the South now that you've got a generation of leadership in Congress, the Republicans, who were very angry at the South and want to punish them for their for the, the evil deeds of the Civil War. Now, one way that we can think about <clears throat> the kind of the two the two sides among Northern whites during the Civil or at, during Reconstruction are those that were in favor of this institution called the Freedmen's Bureau and those who were opposed to the Freedmen's Bureau. Now, the Freedmen's Bureau was a government agency. In some ways, some people consider this to be the very first federal government welfare agency whose job it was to basically, you know, advocate on behalf of all those freed slaves, help them become productive members of society, help them to find jobs, find places to live. Um, it was a it was an attempt by the federal government to try to make things right for all those freed slaves. It wasn't funded very well. It never had enough manpower. It was never, you know, it was never really going to succeed. But as a symbolic thing, this was very important. And a lot of Northerners supported the idea, at least, of this Freedmen's Bureau. However, of course, there were also Northerners who did not agree with this, with the existence of the Freedmen's Bureau. Uh, there was, th this was a, um, campaign flyer from uh, Pennsylvania, which talks about the Freedmen's, which is basically politicizing the Freedmen's Bureau. Uh, this is obviously someone who's opposed to the Freedmen's Bureau, calling it an agency to keep the Negro in idleness at the expense of the white man, uh, vetoed by the pride President Johnson, who we'll talk about in just a sec, made, by, made a law by Congress, support Congress and thereby the Republican Party, and you support the Negro, sustain the president, and by implication the Democratic Party, and you protect the white man. And so even Northerners, Northern whites were kind of divided over things like the Freedmen's Bureau, over whether we should be, whether we as a federal government should be helping these freed slaves or not. Now, let's get back to kind of the political angle of all of this. I mentioned before that Northerners were very angry, which shouldn't be too much of a surprise. 
uh, as this um, drawing is showing here, you've got this Union uh, Cemetery with this southern snake going through it. The southern snake is called a copperhead. Copperheads were Democrats um, and other supposed um, traitors to the cause during the uh, Civil War. Uh, the concept of waving the bloody shirt was a popular political tactic to use at the time where someone would get up to stand, usually a Union or a Northerner, Northern politician who supported the Civil, uh, the Union side of the Civil War, would get up and would regale uh, their Democratic opponents as saying that they were sympathizers of the Confederacy and you know, a blood, some of them would literally wave a, a shirt with blood on it, which is the shirt of a fallen Union soldier, where the, um, the, the, the politician would regale against the Confederate treason and the Democratic treason and all of that. Northerners were very angry at the end of the Civil War again and wanted to see some punishment. Um, <clears throat> so Northerners are mad. Those black codes that I was talking about are going to make Northerners very, very angry. Um, because the, when the sheriff would put the prisoner would kind of make a, a you know, would advertise that, Hey, I've got a prisoner here who can't pay off his fine, pay off his fine. Who wants to come pay it off for him? They would then hold something that looked a lot to Northerners like a slave auction. This is, um, uh, again, this is selling a free man to pay his fine at Monticello, uh, Florida in 1867. Northerners see images like this and they see, oh my God, this is just a, this is a new version of the old slave markets. And if the South is able to do this right now, then oh my God, what did we just fight that civil war for? Why did 360,000 Union soldiers die if we're going to let Southerners basically do the same thing that brought, that brought the war on in the first place? Southerners need to be stopped. So this is going to feed Northern anger also, along with kind of just the general rhetoric of North versus South and all of that. Andrew Johnson, the president who succeeded Abraham Lincoln, is going to be a particular target of Northern anger. Andrew Johnson was a Democrat. He was a Democrat who had represented the uh, state of Tennessee in Congress as a senator. When Tennessee seceded from the Union, Johnson argued that secession was illegal, and he actually stayed in Congress. He did not go back home to Tennessee. He continued to argue, he continued to call himself the legitimate representative of, of the legal government of Tennessee. Um, Tennessee's secession was illegal, and so therefore he's not going to follow their orders. He's going to do his own thing. Lincoln liked that brought him on the ticket in 1864 as his vice president uh, because he wanted to present kind of a unity ticket, the Republican president, the Democratic vice president. Unfortunately, when Lincoln dies, Johnson becomes president. Johnson, even though he believed the secession was illegal, he was still a Southerner through and through, believed in the absolute legitimacy of slavery, recognized that slavery is a dead issue at this point, uh, but he's a full you know, full believer in the racial hierarchies, white man superior to black men. And so he did not favor any type of legislation that fa that that seemed to come at favor black people at the expense of white people. And so he vetoed all kinds of um, legislation like a Civil Rights Act of 1866. He vetoed the Freedmen's Bureau. Um, he is going to become a particular target of Northern Republicans who believe that this guy is causing a whole lot of problems because in some ways, I mean, a lot of Republicans believe that those black codes happen because Andrew Johnson is in office. Southerners believe that Andrew Johnson is their friend and they believe that Johnson's going to let them get away with all kinds of shenanigans in pursuit of racial, of this racial hierarchy. They're probably right in thinking so, but Johnson plays, is, is that is their guy. And so Northerners are going to become very, very angry with Andrew Johnson, um, <clears throat> which we will see, and we'll see how that plays out in a few minutes here. Now, all of that anger is going to translate to massive Republican um, dominance in Congress uh, from the period of 1862 all the way through 1872. For a 10 year period, Republicans are going to absolutely dominate Congress. This is the House of Representatives from those years. Republican power, Republicans and Democrats were almost equal back in 1862 at the beginning of the war, or the early years of the war. By 1872, Republicans, I mean, are dominating in the House of Representatives, 199 to 88. Democrats are 
pretty much a non-existent power in the House of Representatives by 1872. Same thing in the U.S. Senate. Uh, 47 to 19, 47 Republicans to 19 Democrats by 1872. So throughout the this 10-year period, Republicans are in charge. And Republicans are profiting politically off of northern anger and northern resentment against the South and against the Confederacy and against Andrew Jack Johnson and against the Black Codes. All of that stuff was fueling this northern anger and fueling the political success of the Republican Party. All right, so what are the Republicans going to do once they're in office? Start. They're going to start with things like the there was, there was the Civil Rights Act in 1866 that I talked about that, that um, Johnson vetoed, which was an attempt to create some sort of racial equality in the South. Uh, 1877 Reconstruction Act, where basically Congress abolished the state governments of all of those Confederate states, created new military districts. These five military districts that are showing up on this map right here. These military districts, a military governor was put in charge, and the military governor, which was a union officer, was in charge of creating new state governments that would be more friendly towards union ideals. These new state governors, these new military governors, helped to create new constitutions that helped to ensure some level of racial equality for blacks and whites in all these southern states, which is going to create a huge amount of resentment, of course, among the southerners that live in those states. But the purpose of, Reconstru of the Reconstruction Act is to demonstrate northern power, demonstrate that the Union military is in control. And the Union military, which, as I've talked, I talked about last week, was very anti-slavery and was in some ways actually very pro-racial equality. And so Southerners are going to bristle under the control of all these union leaders during uh, and under the kind of the um, administration of this Re Reconstruction Act in 1867. The next year, Republicans are going to pass and enact the 14th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, which is going to completely change the um, relationship between the citizen and the national government. Uh, in some ways, the 14th Amendment is kind of a reinterpretation or a revisioning of the original Bill of Rights. Uh, the original Bill of Rights and all the, the, the constitutional amendments that before the 14th had said that basically all of the constitutional amendments apply to federal uh, government only and not to state governments. The 14th Amendment changes that and says that, nope, the, the federal constitution applies to state governments also. So state governments have to follow the same rules as the federal government and this creates um uh, <clears throat> i mean the, the 14th amendment i mean i could you could spend a week talking about the 14th amendment the, this is probably one of the most important constitutional amendments in american history but in the big picture what it does is it creates basically says that all people born in the united states are citizens of the united states and the state wherein they reside which means if you are a citizen of the united states then you are entitled to all the rights and responsibilities thereof you are, if you're born on, in this country, you are an American citizen, regardless of where your parents were born, regardless of your parents' status, if your parents were slaves, if your parents, you know, from a modern perspective, if your parents were illegal immigrants, but you're born here in this country, that means you are a citizen of this country. In some ways, that's one of the most amazing things about, about the 14th Amendment and the United States in general is this, this idea of birthright citizenship. It's come under a lot of attack lately politically, but... Let's not go into that for now. But the, so the 14th Amendment is a hugely important moment in American legal history, political history, social history, because it says that all those former slaves are citizens of the United States, as long as they were born here. And the vast majority of them had been born here because the, illegal, the international slave trade had been cut off decades ago. Okay, so the 14th Amendment comes to pass in 1868. Um, I will leave it to you to investigate all the various other provisions of the 14th Amendment. Uh, in 1868, that guy Johnson that had ticked off the uh, Re Republicans so much, the Republicans contrived a crime for him to commit, and he committed the crime, and so they put him on trial for impeachment. He survived impeachment, but he promised during the process that he would not interfere with the administration of Reconstruction anymore, which then gave Republicans pretty much a free hand to do whatever they wanted to do. And so... Um, 
the things they decide to do is to create all those new state constitutions. We start seeing African Americans actually start appearing in the halls of Congress for the first time, which is amazing when you think that, you know, 10 years earlier, uh, slavery was the law of the land after the Dred Scott decision. So it's kind of amazing to think that 10 years later you actually have, uh, there's two senators, uh, two uh, black senators in the wake of, um, in the early years of Reconstruction, and there's seven or eight uh, representatives. And then there's also other black faces start appearing in um, various other levels of government. Uh, you know, mayors, state legislatures, suddenly because you've got the Union military governing those military districts under the Reconstruction Act, suddenly black um, former slaves, suddenly they have, they, they're able to vote and they vote for people like them to suddenly start appearing in office, which is a very radical change and a very dramatic change, uh, which is going to also, unfortunately, also trigger a bunch of backlash. All right, so these guys that I was just talking about here, these are kind of the places they're running from. But the, these states, or this map is basically showing that the blue dots are Democrats, but then all the other dots are Republicans. And these black um, politicians are running as Republicans because the Republicans are, you know, the the North. The, the Republicans are the ones that abolish slavery. The Republicans are the ones in charge of the Union Army. Most Union military officers were Republicans. Uh, because the Republicans, Repu the, the party of the North. And so these, these black legislators ran as Republicans and Republicans actually f did fairly well in these, you know, this middle period of Reconstruction, 1871 to 73, which we're seeing here. They did fairly well. Uh, but again, it's because there are union military leaders governing these areas. This isn't a free for all yet, uh, among whites and blacks in the South. We'll get there though. Uh, next, the next big accomplishment that the Republicans are going to do is the 15th Amendment. That 14th Amendment made everybody a citizen, but it never actually explicitly said anything about voting. And so they fixed that by adding a 15th Amendment to the Constitution, which says that the right of citizens in the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the nation or the state on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. So everybody that is a citizen of the United States, as defined in the 14th Amendment, has the right to vote in the 15th Amendment. That's a big step. Okay, now I mentioned that all that stuff is going to spark a backlash. Well, here we go. Uh, the southern, southern whites and some northern whites, especially Democrats, didn't like all of these things that the Republicans were doing. Uh, because, you know, when black legislators went into office, Unsurprisingly, they started calling for things like universal education. They started calling for things that are going to benefit black people. Many of them also benefited white people, but some of them implicitly or explicitly benefit black people. Uh, and every time you do things like, you know, universal education, that costs money, so they would raise taxes. And so you had this situation where you had this new generation of leadership in the South, many of whom were black, and in order to raise funds to create new government programs and agencies and all of that, they had to raise taxes. And so from the Southern white perspective, you've got kind of this double whammy, where suddenly black people are uh, governing white people. And again, if you've grown up in a culture for generations where you've been told over and over and over again that white people are superior in every way to black people, the idea that black people are now governing you and your family as a southern white person is a, as an insult and an affront that is barely imaginable today. But the general sentiment, of course, among most southern whites is that I'll be damned if I'm going to let black people govern me and my family. They want to set up a school for whites and blacks and white kids going to go to school with black kids. I don't think so from a, you know, from the Southern white perspective. And so Southern whites responded angrily to new taxes and just to the very presence of black people in government. And again, all the old racial stereotypes hold as this Harper's Weekly magazine on the right here shows us that, um, you've got these ape like, uh, black people, um, kind of causing a scene in these, in these legislatures that are trying to have peaceful, uh, productive sessions, but black people can't do it, uh, from the, you know, from the, um, 
stereotypical perspective. So a southern white backlash is starting to form in opposition to all of those things that northern whites were doing, or that northern Republicans were doing, I should say. Um, <clears throat> There, you know, the sentiment, mur the murder of Louisiana sacrificed on the altar of radicalism. You've got Ulysses S. Grant with a devil on his shoulder and two black people holding down white women and slaughtering them. That's, I mean, that's, what can you say about that? That's the imagery is that white women, of course, are under threat for black, from black men. I mean, that's a whole nother um, stereotype that we don't even need to get into. But this is all being done on, under the command of union military officers and the devil of course um and so other political cartoons like this guy who had to kill a black child because according to the quote here if i hadn't killed you you'd have grown up to rule me and heaven forbid black people be able to rule over white people so we've got this growing backlash and of course it is eventually going to blow up into further violence um the famous Ku Klux Klan is going to get its start in um, this Reconstruction era. The Ku Klux Klan's goals were not necessarily to wipe out black people. Again, genocide isn't really on the table here, but what they want to do is enforce the old racial norms. They want to uh, demonstrate to black people what it means to move above their place. And so if blacks start to register to vote, that's a problem. If blacks start to call for universal education, that's a problem. If blacks start calling for equal rights, that's a problem. And so the Ku Klux Klan and other white supremacy organizations that pop up during the Reconstruction era are going to be dedicated to rooting out, to, to putting a stop to those radical ideas. Now, the radical ideas are largely coming from the North, and they're largely coming from Republicans. And so the general target for the KKK were Republicans and black people who followed the Republicans. Um, they weren't necessarily trying to destroy all black people. They were just trying to, trying to maintain the racial order. Um, but this got so bad that eventually uh, Ulysses S. Grant, who by this time was president, uh, basically ordered the Union Army to, just, to go find and destroy the, the white supremacist groups like the KKK. KKK. And in 1870 and 1871, the Union military was dedicated to the... Bah was dedicated to eradicating the white supremacist organizations like the KKK, and they largely did that. Um, and so by 1871, the KKK actually ceased to exist in the South. But of course, that's not going to put a stop to um, racial tensions in the South. I mean, just because the KKK is gone, uh, that does not mean that the white supremacist sentiments are going to be gone. So um, we will see other episodes of violence. This note here is a death threat from the Ku Klux Klan against the... Um, the governor of Louisiana, a guy named Henry Warmouth, because Warmouth was a Republican and had supported uh, some rights for blacks after um, emancipation. One of the most famous examples of racial violence in the South came in Louisiana in 1873 in the Colfax Massacre. I invite you to go look up the details on that, but this was one of the bloodiest moments after the Civil War, where somewhere on the order of 300 black people were slaughtered by uh, white um, white rivals for the uh, political for the governor's office in um, Louisiana, and so we see this vile this violence is getting worse and worse. Where the the Union military is able to put down some groups like the KKK, KKK, but that is not putting a stop to racial violence in the South. Um, and then at the same time that the violence in the south is is starting to rise and starting to peak by the by the early to mid 1870s the north is also undergoing a change of heart by the by the mid 1870s um the remember that in the immediate wake of the civil war northerners were very angry at southerners anger only lasts for so long though after a while, you start to get tired of being angry. And so as the 1870s began, so as the 1860s ended and the 1870s began, now we're, we're on the, you know, six, seven, eight years after the Civil War. 
and the fire among northerners to punish southerners is starting to go out. You start to see the rise of new political factions. In the Republican Party, there's this group that call themselves the liberal Republicans. Don't get hung up on the concept of liberal from a modern perspective. It's just, it's just that what they call themselves. The liberal Republicans, though, made the argument that, you know what, it's, it's time to end this. Reconst we're just, reconstruction, by this point, it's been going on for so long. We're just relitigating the Civil War, um, and it's not getting us anywhere. And so by the 18, early 1870s, a group of Republicans are starting to just call for the end of Reconstruction. Basically, let's allow Southerners to just do their own thing. Let's stop trying to force them into something they don't want, because evidently they don't want racial equality. And is it really worth all the pain and the energy that we're going to have to exert to drag Southerners into a new enlightened era? Maybe it'd be better to use our resources somewhere else. Let Southerners do their thing. They'll figure it out eventually, but let's not worry about them anymore. And then there's a bunch of other issues that just start popping up, as happens at any time in, in world history. There's an economic crisis in 1873 uh, where uh, you know people, unemployment starts going up. Farms start getting foreclosed on across the country. And so a lot of Northerners start saying the Reconstruction is just a, it's a distraction. Let's focus on fixing this massive depression that we find ourselves in in the 1870s. Um, there ends up being a bit of a split in the um, uh, gender equality movement and the racial equality movement um, because one thing that you that me may have noticed was that the 15th amendment um basically uh, took all of the old rules of voting and applied them to black people also the old rule of voting of course is that women aren't allowed to vote and so the 1870 amendment the 15th amendment allowed black men to vote but not white women to vote and this is going to spark a bit of a problem for a lot of northerners especially northern women Northern women are going to make the argument that we should that we should be able to vote. And the idea that black men are able to vote, but white women are not, that's difficult for a lot of Northerners to swallow. And so, uh, because again, a lot of Northerners still maintain the same racial sentiments that their forefathers had and the Southerners had. And so a lot of white women share the same racial preconceptions of black people. And so the idea that a black man can vote, but a white woman can't, that's difficult to swallow. And then there's a bunch of Supreme Court decisions that are going to gradually chip away at some aspects of the 14th Amendment and the 15th Amendment. I'm not going to go into detail about any of these court cases, but I invite you to take a look at some of these because they're hugely important. They're going to be hugely important for the 20th century when you get to discussions of civil rights and civil rights movement and all of that. But basically what I'm getting at is that Northerners are starting to lose their fire for fighting the South over Reconstruction. There's a bunch of other stupid little scandals that pop up here and there. Again, I'm not going to go into detail about any of these, but there's just political corruption scandals popping up. And uh, William Belknap was the Secretary of Defense under uh, President Grant, and he ended up getting impeached from office. And uh, there's just tax scandals. And, and basically, you know, just this, the, the normal humdrum of American political life starts to come back to the fore. But the big picture is that Northerners are starting to lose their taste for fighting Southerners anymore. There's just a general malaise or general sense of, let's just move on with our lives. By 1875, when the whiskey ring happens, I mean, Reconstruction's been going on for 10 years. That's a very long time. And so there's a lot of sentiment among Northerners that it's time to just move on. <clears throat> and we start to see that reflected at the polls. Democrats start winning again around 1874. Um, because again, there were, there's just the fire for punishing Southerners is starting to go out in the North. Also, by 1874, 76, 78, all those southern states are starting to come back into the Union, and they're going to, which means that you've got new southern representatives popping up in Congress that had been gone for uh, earlier uh, in this talk. So, by 1874, Democrats are suddenly dominant in the House of Representatives. Uh, and the, um, and that dominance is going to continue through 1876, 1878. 
Those Democrats, of course, aren't going to share the fire of Northern Republicans after the war. So the, these Democrats are going to be dedicated to the idea of ending Reconstruction and letting the South go its own way. Not separate, not secession, but letting it be free from Northern interference. Let it find its own destiny within the United States. In the U.S. Senate, it's going to take a little bit longer because the Senate, with the six-year terms rather than two-year terms, the Senate always lags behind. But eventually, by 1878, the Democrats are going to outnumber Republicans in the U.S. Senate also. And they're going to have, you know, the same sentiment. They're going to want to start shutting down Reconstruction and letting the South go its own way. <clears throat> So what that means on the ground is that all those Republicans who were getting elected from southern states for a while that I was talking about before, yep, they're gone. By 1878, all of almost every political office in the South is, is populated by Democrats again. And the reason that happens is because this map here is showing these, each state here has two dates. The first date is the date that it was re admitted back into the Union. The purple date is the date that the Republican government that was put in place by those Union military generals was booted out of office and replaced by Democrats. And so in some states, like up here in Virginia, this happened almost right away. Um, in other states, like Florida, it's going to take a little bit longer. But by 1877, every former Confederate state uh, will be run by Democrats again. Democrats who are opposed to radical reconstruction, they're opposed to, the, to all of those reconstruction ideas and re reconstruction legislation, and so they're going to want to see some dramatic changes, and now they've got people from these states in Congress again. So the Republican, the old Republican fire is pretty much out. Which brings us to the election of 1877. In 1877, you've got Democrats versus Republicans, obviously, and neither side wins a victory in the Electoral College. And as we all know from recent political history, the winner of the Electoral College is the one that becomes president, not the popular vote. Um, and so in this case, the popular vote, actually the Democrat won more popular votes than did the Republican, but they were deadlocked in the Electoral College. And every time there's a deadlock, if you know your civics, what happens is the election is supposed to get tossed over to the House of Representatives, and the House of Representatives gets to decide who's going to become president. The reality, though, is that as soon as there's a deadlock, both sides start to negotiate feverishly to try to get their guy to win. Or, if their guy isn't going to win, they want to get as much concessions from the other side as possible. And so in the wake of this, this deadlocked presidential election, Democrats and Republicans go into negotiations and they work out a deal. And the deal is known as the Compromise of 1877. And in this deal, the Republican, uh, Rutherford B. Hayes, will become president. Um, in exchange, he will allow the Democrats to maintain control of the South and he will cease all federal intervention in the South. So they're going to recall any union officers that are still in charge in the south. They're going to they're going to they're going to pull the union military out of the south completely. They're going to stop interfering with things like racial discrimination. They're going to they're going to stop talking about racial equality in the south. Um, basically, the Republicans are going to recognize that Democrats are in charge. White supremacy is the name of the game in the south, and they're not going to interfere anymore. They're just going to let Reconstruction come to an end. In exchange, the Democrats recognize that Hayes is the president, and they're going to make some promises to reflect civil and political racial equality in the South. Those promises aren't going to, be, aren't going to mean very much, though. So, this Compromise of 1877 brings an end to Reconstruction uh, on Southerners' terms. Southerners basically get left alone, and once they do, well, we'll see in just a second here. Um, and the, the Compromise of 1877, though, is interesting when you look at it in the long history of these, comp these racial compromises that I've been talking about for a while now, because this is the one that sticks. The Compromise of 1877 is going to pretty much remain in place for the next 80 or 90 years, depending on how you want to add it up, all the way up until the Civil Rights Movement of the mid-20th century. And the reason it succeeded when those others failed is because slavery was no longer on the table. 
all those earlier um, compromises failed because they did not get rid of slavery. But now that slavery is gone, this new compromise can go into effect. And this compromise is going to stick. Um, which means there's going to be a sense of kind of, there's fatigue among Northerners, and also a sense of betrayal among all those Southern blacks who have now been abandoned by Northerners. Um, you know, a lot of Southern blacks saw the writing on the wall, they saw that it was coming, but still there's a sense of betrayal that Northern whites abandoned them. Uh, and that's going to be important for the, you know, much of the 20th century. Um, the old sticking point, the old political issues of slavery and secession and all that, those are dead. Those are no longer important issues anymore. Now the U.S. has been re reunited, and now they can start thinking about other big problems, other big issues that are going to characterize the United States in during the, what's going to be known as the Gilded Age and the Progressive Era and onward, where we're going to be focusing on an industrializing nation, an urbanizing nation, um, full of uh, immigrants from around the world. Um, and it's also going to be a new era focused on rolling back government power. Reconstruction, the Radical Reconstruction Era, was a massive expansion in the size, power, and scope of the federal government. They start embracing things like welfare agencies, like the Freedmen's Bureau. It's a massive federal involvement in the day-to-day -day lives of people around the country. The federal government telling white people how they have to treat black people. That's a huge expansion of government power. With the end of Reconstruction, which was basically an implicit admission that that failed, the power of government was rolled back considerably, which gets us to the Gilded Age, when you hear all these stories about robber barons and uh, vast income inequality and small-scale government that is powerless to stop the depredations of capitalism and all of that. That is a direct consequence of the failure of Reconstruction uh, and the rolling back of federal power in the wake of Reconstruction. Uh, when you've got kind of this this era in which, you know, fat cat businessmen owned politicians and all of that, that comes about because of the end of Reconstruction and the end of this expansion of, of federal power. So that's leading directly to the Gilded Age. And of course, on a, on a racial, ish, racial front, this is going to lead to the creation of Jim Crow segregation. Uh, Jim Crow is the result of the Compromise of 1877, when Northerners basically told the Southerners, do what you want. We're not going to fight you on this anymore. We're tired of it. Let's move on to something else. Southerners then were able to declare victory, and they were able to put into place all of the segregation that was at the heart of those old black codes and vagrancy laws and all of that. They were able to make that a reality. And so the Southerners were able to construct a legal system throughout those con former Confederate states where black people are treated differently from white people and have to endure different lives from white people. And so that's where we'll pick up next time when we talk about the legacies of the Civil War. So stay tuned for that. Uh, in the meantime, I look forward to uh, seeing you online. So have a good day.